Yo, what up dogs? Last week on Saturday, I went to the Blue Beetle at 6.30 p.m. Uh, I went to the opposite end of town. It's ran by the same, you know, corporation, Cineplex. And I thought, let's go over there to see it. And maybe they have concessions. And lo and behold, they have full on concession stands, combos, everything, you name it, they got it. So I'm kind of curious as to why they don't take the food from over there and share it with their, their sister company like across the street. I don't understand it, but I went, um, I had a nap beforehand for sure because I was really tired after that work day. And I uh, just went and saw it in the good old fashioned standard definition. No, no IMAX or anything like that. And when I went to the theater too, there was like, like maybe 10 to 15 people in there. Beside me, there was like a, a woman was beside me. Um, she loved the movie, by the way. She was laughing at everything, <laughs> which made it even more fun for me. So I was laughing too, because there's jokes in here that are actually legitimately funny. And there's some jokes that are just gonna whiff big time. Like, it's a funny movie, but sometimes you're gonna be like, nope, that didn't work. And some of the dialogue too is a little, eh, you know, cringy at times. You're like, Ugh, what's going on here? But in general, I also had a family in front of me and a family behind me. And if you have a family and you're gonna go see this movie, I kind of want to forewarn you that there is some heavier language, like swear words, that your children might not be introduced to yet. And also there is some sexual innuendo jokes that are pretty heavy handed that are for adults, but you might also have to explain something to your child as well. And I personally think if they took that out, just cut all that, they didn't need it. They really didn't need it. It was funny, but they didn't need it. And that would have helped maybe make this uh, more appealing to families with younger children as well. So we get into, oh, wait, hold on a second. Let's get the notes out. Let's just break this film down, you know. I, uh, I wrote down on here for once, I wrote down a couple extra things. This movie is PG-13. It runs for two hours and seven minutes. And I think it's, a too, it's too long. This movie should have been a tight hour 45. And they, there's a lot of things they could easily cut out of this film. Um, because it's, it's a long film. There's a lot of things going on in this movie. And like, even for me to talk about everything that goes on in this movie, we're talking like a three, like a 30 minute review. You know what I'm saying? There's so much that goes on in this film. It's kind of crazy at how much they cram into this film. But also I have to say I was engaged for the entire two hour runtime. You know what I'm saying? Like it didn't bore me at all, but I was kind of just like, wow, that was, that was longer than expected. And we could have trimmed that down and kept that same fanatic pace and it would have probably been a better experience for many people. Now, it's been requested. Let's talk about the box office real quick. So, the movie was made for $130 million. And honestly, it shows on the screen. And not in a negative way, in a positive way. It looked like they put all the money into this movie. Every single dime, nickel, penny, went into making this film. And it shows, like it's actually, I was like, Wow, that's a $130 million, million dollar movie right here. And it looked good. There's some really nice set pieces in here. It's, the CGI looks good. Um, I didn't think there was any really questionable CGI. Um, yeah, it just looked good for $130 million. There's some scenes in here where I was like, that's a beautiful set piece. The, the Ted Cord basement of his mansion, that set piece, I really enjoyed it actually. Nice throwback to the 80s. It really reminded me of Tron. Um, like when he opens up the arcade and you get all those beautiful lights and stuff. That was a beautiful set piece. Um, and just to bring up the note of the, bod the budget, the weekend box office report for the first week, it only made $25 million, which is sad. This movie probably should have made 50 out the, get out the gate. Be, but here's why I don't think it did it because this is a D-list movie star or sorry comic book character that I don't think many people would even know and even I myself I know who Blue Beetle is but I don't know the character that well I know he hung out with uh, uh, what's his face oh geez Blue Beetle and thing gold see even that I'm <laughs> booster gold even then, I'm drawing a brain fart, you know what I'm saying? And it's like, if you, he's very niche. So I don't see why people would be drawn to go and see this character. It's someone that we've never seen or ever heard of. Like, he's a D-list, you know what I'm saying? Um, 
and it's very hard to start a franchise with the, like someone on on the bench, so to speak, you know. Um, and also, you know, I think James Gunn kind of torched the DCU kind of with, and like no one has any interest in going to see DC movies anymore. Anyways, that's a comment for another day. Talk about it down below. Um, let's talk about this movie really quick. It's a, there's a lot to go through, and I'm going to blaze through it. Okay. So the director is um, Angel. Manuel Soto, and I hope I pronounced his name correctly. I'm gonna struggle with a lot of these Mexican names. I'm sorry, I am Canadian, I don't know Spanish, and I barely speak French. And uh, <laughs> this is my first time uh, watching a movie by him, and honestly, I thought he did a very well job, like very well with this movie. Like, I, I would definitely watch another movie by him. And if he, I hope he gets to make the sequel to this film. I think he earns it, even though it's not doing well in the box office. I actually think he earns the right to make the sequel. You know what I'm saying? Um, but yeah, I look forward to seeing something else by him. Maybe a new IP, whatever. It doesn't matter. Something. So we have our introduction to this world of the, uh, the Blue Beetle, right? And it lands on Earth with this orb. And our villain is Victoria Cord, played by Susan Sarandon, has found this orb. And they're conducting experiments on it. And they're trying to get the scarab or the beetle out of it and her henchman is um conrad carapax who is played by real max trujillo i hope i pronounced his name correctly um he's a villain he works begrudgingly for victoria cord and we he has a, a really good no i wouldn't say really good a well thought out storyline from point a to point b because like and i'm just gonna gloss over it he is the muscle he's the military um he works for her begrudgingly. He has all this cyber implants in him that we learn about uh, as the movie goes on. And she is kind of like, um, he, uh, sorry, he is like the f the prototype of what Victoria Cord wants to build with this Blue Beetle technology. Um, when she gets the Blue Beetle technology, her goal is to make super armored suits for war and policing people. That's her whole objective. And she has another sidekick, uh, Dr. Sanchez, who's played by Harvey Guillen. And he's kind of in the middle of everything. Like, he's, he's kind of a, um, a fool, in a sense. And uh, he's a, he is a smart person because he is able to actually extract the code and data from the Blue Beetle. But he's also very aloof, in a sense. And um, he has a good story arc, too, to the point where he works for the villain and you know, he has a very heroic end, so to speak, and I don't want to spoil it for you. So we are introduced to these three people and their whole motive is, let's get the Blue Beetle back to our labs, unlock its code, make super soldiers with it, use Carapax as the spokesperson and um, kind of like the first iPhone, so to speak, and show it off to military uh, people and get contracts for future money and Cord makes all the money, right? But now we need the hero. So we're introduced to uh, uh, Jaime Reyes, who's played by Zolo Marduena. And he's our reluctant hero, okay? And he comes back from school, college. He's a college graduate of pre-law. And he finds out that his family, who is a great family. The family is great. I, I really like them. They have a very nice dynamic to them. And um, when they're all together, there's like really good dialogue flow. They're very chippy, like just how a family talks when they're in a big family and surrounded by each other. And there's a lot of love in this family too, like a lot of love. And they have really good story arcs too. Um, some of them we don't need, but some of them, whatever, helps drive the story along. Uh, but yeah, we'll get to the grand, uh, the, the uncle. But the, the family itself um, is like uh, the daughter, the mother, father, Nana, and the uncle and the uncle is a big conspiracy nut and we'll get into him later so Jaime's back um, he learns about the family woes he has to go get a job he works for Victoria Cord as a busboy slash like cleaner and he gets fired from the job because he disrupts her and she's just like Victoria Cord is just an old school bitch you know what I'm saying she doesn't like anybody and then we're introduced to Jenny Cord who is played by hold on uh, uh, Bruna Marquinzine, I'm sorry guys, I'm going to butcher all these, all these names, <sighs> I'm sorry, <laughs> um, 
So we're introduced to Jenny Cord, who is our also our hero. And uh, this is where uh, Jaime and Jenny are introduced to each other. She f sees him losing his job and she offers him to get a new job at Cord Enterprise or yeah, Cord, Cord Industry. So the next day, Jaime shows up with his family. There's a joke there, but it's actually quite annoying. It's not a good joke. It's funny because it's awkward, but it's also annoying because of some of the comments that have been made about the corporations. It's, it's, it's weird, weird placement. Um, so he goes into the office and Jenny Cord is in the office as well, but she's not there to see Jaime. She's on her own little mission to steal the Blue Beetle. Um, so she does, and she leaves with the Blue Beetle. The uh, alarms are all set and stuff, and she bumps into Jaime, and she's like, take this if you want to live. <laughs> and he, so he does, and he goes back home. And the family's like, oh, you didn't get the job? And she's, he's like, no, I didn't get the job, but she, Jenny uh, gave me this. They open it up, and it's the Scarab. And then the Scarab attaches to Jaime. And that's a really cool scene, to be perfectly honest. I thought the uh, body horror element to it was really well done. And when the AI slash symbiote, whatever you want to call it, nanotechnology, because we don't really know what it is. We don't learn much about what the Blue Beetle it is or its history or where it comes from. We, it's very sparse on, those information, on that information. So... It takes hold of Jaime and like blasts off into space, you know what I'm saying? And it's running through its diagnostics and EXE programs trying to like, you know, it's being woken up, you know what I'm saying? So it's just taking Jaime on this like trip um, around <laughs> all over the place and it's just like running its like system updates and all that stuff, right? It's a good scene actually. And uh, there's some silliness with it as well. Like that's where you see the bus get cut open in the trailer and all that jazz. And then like Jaime, um, kind of doesn't understand what is going on to him and um, he gets sent back home and he's naked and there's new jokes here. There's some good jokes in here in, the, in this section um, but again this is like where you might want to be like hey kids cover your ears because they're going to say some weird jokes here. Um, George Lupa, Lopez who plays Rudy Reyes he does a lot of the comic relief in this and he's a little outlandish at times and almost like, it's just like, okay, <laughs> you're, you just say things. I'm like, are you ad-libbing? You know what I'm saying? There's a lot of stuff in this movie around the family element where I'm like, um, it's a little heavy handed, so to speak, where it seems like they're trying to tell the audience, hey, this is a Mexican family. This is how we live. And I'm like, do I need all this information? Like, I'm, I don't know. I've been watching more movies for 40 years. I understand, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I understand families. So it's just like, it's so weird. And like the, the one scene, I'm going to have to backtrack. The one scene when Jaime comes back and the family's all there, right? And they're like, let's go get tacos. So they go to a taco joint. And I'm sitting there, I'm like, why would I go to a taco joint when I have a Nana and or a mom who probably makes the best tacos in Palmero City. You know what I'm saying? If I go home to my mom, I'm asking for some banana bread because my mom makes the best banana bread in town. I'm not taking my mom to a store to go buy banana bread in front of her. That's disrespectful. And I just thought, this is so weird. <laughs> Why would Jaime go to a burrito spot with his parents when he's probably got the best damn burritos in town? Damn you, Jaime. <laughs> Anyways, back to the story. So Jaime's learning about the suit. Jenny shows up. She's like, oh, it's Symbiote. It joined you. You guys are now one. And you have to figure it out. Somehow she knows stuff about the core thing. But we figure that out, right? We learn about how she knows the uh, Blue Beetle technology. So he, uh, what happens next? They have a plan because they want to, Jaime wants the suit out of him, the Symbiote out of him. So they hatch a plan. They got to go back to Cord Industries to get a key. And I just want to point something out in this film here. Everything is on easy mode. S Jenny steals the beetle easily with no freaking problems, no confrontation at all. Now Jenny goes, they go back to Court Industries to steal a key, which is literally at the front desk. <laughs> and she just breaks into it, takes the key and leaves. But this time when they leave, um, they're uh, confronted by Carapax. And Carapax is in his, his suit of armor, and they have the first fight of Blue Beetle versus Carapax. And it's a good fight. 
um, Carapax gets owned, Blue, Blue Beetle gets owned because he doesn't really know his powers yet. And so the fight ends kind of a, as a draw, I would say. So now, Jenny, uh, Jaime, and Rudy, does the whole family go there? No, they go, just those three, go and escape to a place where they don't think Victoria could find them, which is uh, Ted Cord's house. That's Jenny's father's mansion. And so they go in there and they go to the basement and this is where like the beautiful scene is, where it's like Tron and everything lights up and stuff. And we learned that Ted Cord was the original Blue Beetle or one of the one of the Blue Beetles. There's three in technically. And I think this one is only dealing with Ted Cord and, and uh, Jaime. So he's the Blue Beetle. And this is a cool scene in general. I really liked it. And it felt lived in because uh, Rudy even explains like, oh yeah, we had a blue beetle uh, back in the 80s or whatever, and uh, he looked after Palmero City, and it kind of felt like there's more superheroes and superhero history in other areas. Like it felt lived in at this point. Like now I was like, oh, this is a world of superheroes. It's not just Blue Beetle and himself. You know what I'm saying? And um, what else happened here? So it was kind of revealed to Rudy. He's like, oh, I didn't know Ted Cord was the Blue Beetle. And there's some jokes here too. This is also where they mentioned Batman's a fascist. Oh, I have to point out that Rudy somehow is like a technical guru. Like he knows how to make stuff. Like he made this device that can jam all the um, uh, video cameras and security cameras in Cord industry. That's how he, that's how Jenny and them were able to just walk right in and take the stuff because he's like high level IQ all of a sudden. You would never think it when you see him, but I don't know. I, I just don't know. It's like, okay, because you don't know much about Rudy. He's crazy. He's like loco, you know? Um, and because he's all about conspiracy theories, but he, somehow he's a technical wizard. And then he fires up Ted Kord's computer and they start doing computer stuff. And Rudy knows how to do everything. and. Jaime is having troubles because he doesn't really understand the suit and Jenny's trying to help him with the suit and they have a really touching moment together and they almost make out. Jenny and Jaime are love interests. It's actually really nice. So then again, uh, Jaime's like, well, I gotta get this suit going. And so he, what's he do? Oh yeah, he goes to the top of the building and he pulls a Shazam, right? Where, you know, the Shazam one where he runs off the building and goes, Shazam! This one, Blue Beetle's like, I'm just gonna run off the building and hope for the best that the suit starts up and doesn't wanna kill me, you know what I'm saying? So he kinda of pulls a Bruce Banner in a sense. So he jumps off, the suit activates, and he flies off to home. I don't I forget why he goes home, but he does. Um, and then when he gets home, um, the uh, Victoria Cord shows up with a big SWAT team and army and stuff like that and like takes down Blue Beetle. And it's a good scene because Blue Beetle um, the Blue Beetle itself, the symbiote, um, which is the, the AI or the voice in his head is called Kaja Day. And that, she's played a, a voice by uh, Becky G. Um, she, the, the AI itself uh, wants to kill or the symbiote wants to kill. And Jaime is like, please, let's not kill anyone. I don't want to kill. So he has this dilemma. And then when he finally has a new confrontation with... Um, these soldiers that are attacking his family, he's like, okay, Sue, I will let you do you, but don't kill. So they have a compromise. And so they do this suit stuff and beat up everybody. But during this battle, Victoria Cord unleashes some technology that shuts the Blue Beetle suit down and it wraps around him. And we have some devastation in Jaime's life because his father dies during this battle. It's very touching sequence like it's upsetting you know it's it's actually really well done i have to say you might cry there anyways now the blue beetle's captured the family's like kind of mourning the death oh they are mourning the death of the father and they go you know what we have to we have to save jaime so they go back <laughs> to ted cord's lab or underground bunker basement and they fool around with all the toys in there and they pick up the Blue Beetle space mobile and go after Jaime where uh, they're at some Victoria Cords castle out in the middle of nowhere. It almost looks like it's like a modern, like a weird Alcatraz, like it's just out there. And so they go and uh, try to save Jaime. And there's some good sequences in here, but you know what's really weird in this sequence? Um, so when they go in, so the family has no quor, quorms about killing. <laughs> 
I think the family kills more people than Jaime. Period. Like, there's a scene where they're charging the castle with the blue beetle machine, and you see the beetle leg impale a dude and fling him. And I'm like, that guy's dead. <laughs> Rudy has no problems killing anyone. And same with uh, Nana, which is in the trailer as well. Well, you don't see the death in the trailer, but you know, she kills people. Like there's a lot of death, but Jaime doesn't want to kill anybody. He has more moral scruples than his family. It's, it's weird. Um, yeah, so they say, so Jaime's strapped up and uh, the, the DNA or the uh, data or whatever you want to call it, code of the Blue Beetles being sucked out of him and transferred into Carapax and more mobile suits, okay? And this is where the family hatches the plan of saving him and all this stuff. But in this moment, Jaime is dying, right? And he goes into a dream sequence. And this part is freaking probably the best scene in the movie. It could be the best scene in the movie. He sees his dad in the afterlife, get ready to cry a little bit. And his dad and Jaime, they just have a conversation. You know what I'm saying? And his dad's like, this is your time, man, to go. You know what I'm saying? Actually, now this, wait, hold on. I wrote down the dad's name here. Do, 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 do. Hold on, father, there we go. His name is Alberto Reyes in the movie and it's played by Damien Alcazar. And so he's the father. And, uh, yeah, man, it's such a heartwarming scene. And he's like, son, you were destined to be the Blue Beetle. Now go to the Beetle. And like he pushes him off and like his soul flies into the Blue Beetle's soul or the AI. We don't know much about the Blue Beetle, right? And then they combine and Jaime wakes up and he's like, oh, I am Iron Man. <laughs> <laughs> and he like breaks free and Carapax has finished downloading uh, all the Blue Beetle information. So now Carapax is like super Carapax. Um, and we have a great scene here where Sanchez saves Jaime by closing the door behind him because Carapax is like losing his mind. And also, <clears throat> so there's a whole, okay. There's a great scene in here too with Carapax, maybe the third best scene in the movie. So Carapax has a locket right and he's getting jacked in and he's looking at the locket and you think it's his family like uh, his wife or son or something like that right and uh susan sarandon's character victoria court takes it away from him and she's like i'll hold on to this right puts it away so you don't think about it anymore you're like oh he's a family like things are happening to carapax throughout this movie where he's starting to doubt his belief of family ruins everything but really family is life man it's love you know what i'm saying and so Jaime's freed, Carapax is freed. They're doing a big epic fight, you know, good CGI fight. And it's a good fight, actually. I enjoyed it. And uh, uh, Blue Beetle, Jaime, is going to kill Carapax. Like, he's so done with this guy because he's, like, harmed his family and stuff like that. And he goes to kill him, and the Blue Beetle AI, or whatever you want to call it, the symbiote, stops him and says, No, Jaime. We don't kill. And it's a good scene. Like it's it's built up properly. It's good. And Jaime's like just so angry. Like he's, but he's calm. And um, the Blue Beetle suit says, I was able to grab Carapax's memories during the, the download transfer. And then like it flushes the memories of Carapax into uh, Jaime. And we learn about Carapax's history. And it's so touch, like it's sad, man. It's good though. And it even reminds Carapax, like he's, like Blue, Blue Beetle is like flooding their memories and it wakes Carapax up to the point where he's like, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm a monster. Like he has a Frankenstein moment, right? And so he starts overloading his power core because he can, and he grabs Victoria cord and he walks away into the fire and he explodes. And like everyone runs away from it, obviously, happily ever ending. And it's such a good ending, man. Like, there's things in this movie that are legitimately good and well thought out and surprising, you know what I'm saying? And I'm like, damn, this, there's some really good stuff in here. And they could have, like I said, cut out like 15 minutes of it because some, like, they could have cut out some, some of the jokes and tightened up a couple sequences to make this a better movie. Um, but man, there are some scenes in there where you're just going to be like, that was freaking good. I'm quite surprised. And so... The ending is quite simple. It's very straightforward, right? Um, the ending's over, the monster's defeated, Jaime goes back home, um, uh, Victoria Cord's dead, so Jenny Cord takes over, 
Um, Jenny Cord comes back to the to the keys where Jaime lives and his family lives and their house is burnt down. The father's dead. They just finished the uh, funeral uh, for the father and uh, Jenny Cord shows up and she's like, I'm gonna help your family and we're gonna rebuild your house and stuff like that. I'm looking over the thing, you, you are the blue beetle. And then they share a kiss at the end and they fly off like Superman and Lois Lane. It's like, I can't, damn, there's some good callbacks in this film. It is. You know what's funny about my reviews? <laughs> I start off like not hyped, but like I'm into it. And then as I start talking about the movie, I get more and more hyped because I'm like, oh yeah, this movie was not that bad. You know what I'm saying? It was actually a good film. Um, that's the end of my review, by the way. <laughs> you know what? All films are good. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever, man. I was entertained. You know what I'm saying? So here we go. Would I buy this movie and put it into my collection? Yes, I would. And you know what? I think this movie, if no one said anything about it being tied to the DCEU or anything like that, this movie as a standalone film is actually good. Um, it doesn't need to be a part of the DCEU. It can be, Blue Beetle can be its own thing on its own and thrive. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't need to be attached to Batman, Wonder Woman, Superman or anything like that. And I think that's the problem was part of the marketing of like, oh yes, is it DCU? And it's like, no, it didn't need to be. It didn't need to be. This movie on its own is actually good. You know what I'm saying? And it deserves the some attention. Like sure, it's not perfect. And there is flaws in this movie. We could sit down and pick apart this movie easily, but there's actually some really good heartwarming sequences in this film that st make it stand up, stand up. You know what I'm saying? Where you're just like, damn, that was good. You know what? I feel happy inside. I was entertained. And that's all we want. We just want to be entertained, right? Anyways, that's the end of my review, guys. I, I, I liked it. I would buy it in my collection. I think you should go and see it on a cheap night. Go and see it. Um, bring your fam family. Friends, it's, it's, it, you won't be disappointed. That's the way I look at it. You would not be disappointed seeing this movie in the theater. And if you don't want to see it in the theater and you want to just wait till it comes out on, you know, digital or physical, you know what? This is going to be potentially a very good rainy day type of film. Something you put on on a rainy day, get yourself a nice little blanket, maybe a hot chocolate, and just relax and enjoy an entertaining film. I think this has the potential to be a good rainy day film for sure. Anyways, I'm out. I gotta go to work. The next movie I'm going to see is either Equalizer 3, Gran Turismo, and maybe Strays. Maybe Strays. I want to see it, but I don't know if I got the time to see it because my work schedule is changing and it's crazy. So bear with me as always. Um, I'm out of here. Have a good day. And uh, whatever movie you're watching, I hope you're digging it and loving it. I'm out as always. Peace and bye.